We'll do the, the Russian hacking story first, as, as much detail as you want to give us. Um, the, the March 19th, the, the Times reports, you get an email um, uh, that turns out to be a phishing um, email. Um, do you remember getting that? What happened? What happened? And how, how does 60,000 of your emails end up in, in, the, in the Russians' hands? Um, well, in some ways I have. Uh, uh, one lesson I learned is I had a, a number of people had access to my email account, uh, one of whom checked with one of our security people about whether it was a phishing email, was told, no, it was real. Uh, and uh, um, uh, another one of my staff people uh, clicked on the link and uh, Zoom. At the time, I was not aware that I had been hacked and it took a while to develop that. And it wasn't until the, uh, really in the fall that the full contents of my uh, email was, was, it was, was clear that it was going to be you know, put put out into public. I didn't really know what they had taken uh, for for many many months. I'd say. You look back at that now, and that that one typo or whatever the story is on why the person pushed the 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 uh, the button, um, and and what what were the effects? Well, the effects were uh, to kind of weaponize WikiLeaks to try to harm our campaign to help Donald Trump and try to get Donald Trump elected. And it was clear we're being done by Russian intelligence agents. Now there's been more reporting on that. Uh, and um, <clears throat> again, even throughout the course of the summer, it was clear that there are two different groups of uh, military-related Russian intelligence agents uh, going after Democratic accounts. And uh, the fact that uh, that my account had been breached uh, was, you know, the latest in a, in a, in a series. Uh, but that gave a weapon to the Russians to try to influence our election, and indeed I think that had an effect uh, and helped elect Donald Trump. Obviously, uh, during the course of the campaign, uh, we had criticized Trump for uh, adopting foreign policy positions that were more consistent with Vladimir Putin's than uh, the bipartisan tradition of the United States. Uh, everything from uh, weakening NATO to not uh, uh, saying that we would live up to our, uh, what are called our Article 5 obligation, our, our uh, obligation to come to the common defense of other NATO countries, uh, to uh, uh, essentially taking uh, the Putin line uh, with respect to what they were doing in Syria, including <clears throat> bombing civilians and and uh, committing what uh, many people thought were uh, tantamount to war crimes. Uh, Trump, throughout the course of uh, his time uh, in running for uh, president, was a, basically an apologist for Putin. The uh, invasion of Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea, were all things that, that basically he adopted. Uh, he, the Russians returned the favor. And it was certainly clear to them that Secretary Clinton was, was, was uh, no, no uh, they were no fan of Secretary Clinton. Well, I think she, she had had a uh, contentious relationship uh, with Putin. When, when uh, President Obama was elected, uh, President Medvedev was, was the president of Russia. Uh, and. Uh, that was a time of, of some cooperation between our two countries, uh, uh, particularly around uh, st uh, strategic arms reductions. Uh, we successfully uh, c completed a, a new treaty to, to uh, reduce uh, the threat of nuclear weapons by reducing the numbers uh, on both sides. Putin was then the prime minister. When he uh, reassumed the presidency, things uh, started to sour. Uh, and. Uh, pr uh, as Secretary of State, Secretary Clinton was uh, critical of, of Putin, particularly his anti-democratic uh, activities um, in Russia. Uh, and he uh, was, I think, uh, obviously took offense by that. Last summer, <clears throat> as the WikiLeaks publish, uh, start, start publishing the DNC um, um, emails just before the convention, um, what is the, what's the feeling 
What's the feeling in the campaign? Uh, what is the worry in the campaign about um, what is going on? How much do you know at that point, um, and how much do you think that that uh, that uh, this is this is going to go on for a while, and and uh, you guys have to deal with it? Well, you know, it wasn't one of those things that it has an instant explosion and then goes away. We uh, were. Uh, knew or felt that uh, this could go on for a while. Uh, they were, uh, the sites that were releasing information, Guccifer 2.0, DC leaks, WikiLeaks, uh, I think it was became fairly clear to experts who study these things on the outside. Certainly, I, I uh, assume, uh, became clear uh, to people inside the government, although very little information was coming to us. Uh, were associated with these hacks that had been done by, by Russian intelligence agencies. We began to uh, warn the press about that, talk about it publicly, uh, say that this was an a, attack on our democratic processes. Uh, I think the press, and particularly the mainstream press, were more interested in the contents of the leaks than where they had come from or what the, what the uh, democratic threat really was uh, for a uh, foreign government uh, interfering in our election. I think they're, uh, they remain um, uh, defensive about that point, but I think they were more interested in the campaign gossip than they were into the source of the leaks. The New York Times wrote um, a quote that was pretty interesting, written by one of the guys who was just in here, and you, you referred to it in the op-ed piece. That in, in, in some ways, the press became uh, an instrument of Russian intelligence. I mean, what was the what was the concern? What were you telling the press at that point, and, and what was the reality behind that? Well, look, I think this story developed over the course of the campaign, but I think that uh, clearly uh, by the time the, the leak of the, of particularly my, the contents of my personal emails, uh, uh, Ambassador Marshall's emails, etc., this was, as I, as I said, well, uh, a weaponized uh, uh, effort uh, to try to hurt our campaign. If uh, uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks were interested in transparency, they would have dumped them out all at once. But instead, there was a, a bleed. Just to put that a little bit in context, the, uh, the leaks of my emails had been foreshadowed uh, in August uh, by Roger Stone, who's closely associated with Mr. Trump. Uh, but they didn't occur uh, until October, an hour after the Excess Hollywood tape became public. So clearly, I think this, this was done to some extent to distract uh, the press, to get them off the Access Hollywood uh, story. That was too big a story to get off of, uh, but I think they wanted to, uh, you know, it was, it was a witting uh, strategy to try to, again, influence the conversation, influence the press coverage, uh, influence uh, what the American people were, re were receiving in terms of the information that they were going to need to make up their minds. And I think that if you look back at the coverage, uh, the New York Times has done post-election a fairly good reconstruction of what happened. But pre-election, uh, over and over again, even as they covered uh, the leaked material, they uh, would constantly uh, refer to that as uh, stolen information that the Clinton campaign claims came from Russian sources. Now, obviously, the intelligence community confirmed that uh, late in the cycle, uh, and now they've obviously reconstructed uh, what happened. And, uh, that, but that was pretty well known before the, uh, be before the election by, again, uh, outside experts, government experts, uh, and yet they, I think, uh, began to undermine the veracity of the claim even in their own coverage. So that's something that they'll have to review and uh, consider uh, as they think about uh, this new world we're living in that's a world of fake news and, uh, and stolen uh, information, uh, uh, purloined information, stuff that's been made up. Uh, even in the in the original uh, release, uh, there was uh, factual inaccuracies in, in what Assange put out. So I think 
Uh, we live in a world where, uh, uh, you know, Trump was noted for lying 70 percent of the times he was fact-checked. Uh, and it's very hard. I think it's been, it's been hard for the press to catch up with that, hard to know uh, how to deal with uh, information that's coming uh, directly from, uh, from foreign intelligence sources. And, you know, they're going to have to do a lot of, I think, self-reflection about how they cover that in future elections, because I don't think, I think if anything, that what this has done is it probably emboldened uh, Putin, who started doing this in, in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, interfering in other elections, in his own elections, and if you can call him that anymore, in Russia. Uh, but, it, you know, we see it now uh, in support uh, for uh, <clears throat> authoritarian-aligned parties in, in Europe. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, it's just, it's going to be a fact of democratic life. And I think the press is going to have to decide uh, what kind of context they put around information that they're reporting on. Um, as the emails were being released, I mean, what was the reaction? What were, what were the conversations that you might have had with, with Secretary Clinton or others um, about the way Trump was dealing with it, the way Trump was jumping on these uh, WikiLeak releases and telling the press, you've got to, you've got to look at these things, you've got to report on these things. Well, he did more than that, I think, really from the uh, early summer when the, when the DNC emails started to be released. He encouraged the Russians to do more of it. In previous election, it would have been jaw-dropping jaw uh, for a presidential candidate uh, to encourage uh, a foreign adversary, really, uh, to uh, uh, hack the, the democratic process and do more releases. But in fact, he did that and he did it without consequence. When you heard that speech that he gave, what did you guys decide to do? What, what could you do when he's making statements like that? Look, I think we tried to push back. We, we, uh, we raised it. We uh, tried to have people who uh, were experts, really, in... Um, not just in cybersecurity and foreign policy, people who served uh, at senior levels of government. Obviously, myself, the, the, our other a senior campaign uh, spokespeople uh, 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 tried to counterattack, tried to uh, uh, argue to the American people that, that this was uh, not just unbecoming a, a presidential campaign, but was downright dangerous. And uh, again, it was uh, in, the, in the swirl, in the world of... Uh, the you know 140 character news cycle. Uh, sometimes that stuck. Uh, sometimes it didn't. Uh, I think it was it was a point uh, that we made in arguing that uh, he was uh, unfit really to serve as president of the United States. I don't take much solace in this, but I think the American public, in the end of the day, a majority agreed with us. 20 percent of the people who voted for him in exit polls said that he was unfit for office, but they voted for him anyway. Were you surprised at the effectiveness of these tactics, of, think, of saying things like, like uh, the fact that, that the Russians should, should hack into the 30,000 missing emails? We, I don't know that we were surprised, uh, but we were, um, uh, you know, we were in a constant uh, combat uh, with him. And I think one of the things that he perfected was by, um, to give him his due, I guess, is that he figured out that the press would change the subject almost not, not I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but almost on an hourly basis, by just something slightly more outrageous than what he had just said. So the coverage was always flipping uh, to uh, one of his latest statements, and that was, uh, you know, no doubt challenging. Uh, again, I think we felt like uh, we had a strategy for dealing with that. Uh, we had an argument that I think that Secretary Clinton uh, prosecuted uh, particularly well in the three debates, uh, which we felt like she had uh, won each of, each one of. Uh, which was that this is not the behavior that uh, of someone we want to entrust with the nuclear codes. We don't want uh, him uh, uh, breaking with bipartisan tradition uh, in foreign policy, and uh, and again that his ideas were dangerous, and and that 
that uh, that he was um, just uh, by his temperament uh, as well as his judgment uh, uh, unsuited to be president of the United States. That argument didn't stick for some reason. Why do you? Well, think? it did stick. It just well, it just didn't prevail in the electoral college. Uh, I mean, it did stick in the sense that. By the end, a majority of the public really believed that. Uh, perhaps that's why she got nearly three million more votes than he did nationally. Uh, but he had a different argument, and he had an argument uh, that prevailed amongst uh, uh, a group of people who felt like, uh, I guess, as he said in in uh, uh, in in, uh, in one of his arguments, what he got to lose. And I think people felt uh, disenfranchised from uh, from their government, from the economy, felt like they had been left out and left behind, and they were uh, willing to take a radical chance on someone uh, who was uh, saying that he would blow up the system. And, uh, and that, that prevailed in enough places that, that uh, he was able to capture uh, thin majorities, but majorities in the in the states that he needed to win in the in the electoral in the electoral college. Uh, and as I noted, again, I'm just quoting the exit polls. Twenty percent of the people who voted for him uh, thought he was unfit for office. So we'll see how that works out. I think that's uh, to some extent unprecedented in in, in American politics. But uh, you know, we're, it's not just an American trend or not just something that we face. But it's been. Uh, true globally, you've certainly seen that in Europe. It's almost a primal scream for uh, change or for resistance to globalization, and and uh, he found a way to take advantage of that and, and get a, a electoral college victory. Let me ask you a couple more questions about the WikiLeaks things, and we'll we'll go, we'll go more into the to the general uh, campaign. Okay. Um, the the October your the WikiLeaks uh, starts releasing your uh, emails, and as you said. He's, you know, drip by drip by drip by drip. Right. Um, <clears throat> when they were coming out, um, were you were you surprised when the first ones were released? Were you was there a conversation on on how one sh should deal with it? How should deal with it? The worries about, you know, where this was going. Well, we we uh, uh, quickly put together a team that had actually been assembled just just before that because we. Uh, again, the, they were tipping their hand that that they had something and they were going to they were coming after us. Uh, the first person who was directly involved, I think, with from a campaign perspective, who had emails released was Ambassador Marshall. And then, uh, so we were trying to get on top of it. We had assigned a team of of uh, technical experts and and researchers. Uh, to try to manage uh, what was a tremendous volume of uh, of information, um, and this was a daily phenomenon. So we had uh, people from press team and and from our research team and our tech team uh, trying to for, forecast what they might do and to deal with what they had done uh, and to respond uh, and to try to uh, manage and knock down. Most of the uh, uh, coverage really was about inside campaign gossip. It wasn't, uh, you know, earth-shattering, or, or uh, but it was a constant, uh, uh, you know, uh, pain to our campaign, and it was, uh, you know, it filled up uh, time on cable television, and and uh, and I think one of the things that that uh, it. With, with a, a kind of secondary consequence was uh, it was always easier to cover that than to cover whatever the substance uh, of the campaign uh, was, whatever um, uh, Hillary was saying uh, out, out on the campaign trail. Uh, and so it kind of obliterates your ability to have a positive message. Uh, we obviously had wanted to uh, try uh, again at the end of a campaign. I think what people want to hear about is the future. Uh, but we were uh, stuck in a cycle in which, you know, the the dominant coverage uh, was either, again, something outrageous he had said or uh, something they had leaked. So we were uh, always dealing with that and it made it more difficult 
uh, to try to uh, break through with what she wanted to do for the country, what she, what her concerns were, why uh, she believed that you know the country would succeed more by bringing people together rather than the campaign of division that 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 Trump was was running. The problems that it brought for the campaigner are pretty clear because of the fact that it kept on coming up. But these were your emails. I mean, did this also take a personal toll on on you? Yeah, I tried to deal with it as a professional. You know, uh, that's all I can say. The the um, I suspect no one would would uh, uh, like to be put in the circumstances I was put in, and certainly I was. I felt badly for the what became kind of collateral damage, not just of uh, of private emails that people thought would would obviously never become public, uh, but the. But then the conspiracy theories, the fake news, the what ended up culminating in uh, you know somebody getting in a car and coming to a pizzeria in Washington with a, a loaded weapon and shooting the you know shooting uh, his weapon in 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 uh, and being arrested, the collateral damage, which was not just the release of the information, but then the Hyper conspiracy nature of fake news, also uh, fomented by Russian sources and others, uh, by the alt right movement, by Russian sources, uh, was really, I think, uh, uh, you know, after all these years uh, in politics, my th uh, skin is pretty thick, uh, and so in the in that sense, I don't like feel like I have a. Uh, any sense of privacy anymore, so it didn't bother me from 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 that perspective. But it bothered me that that my friends were being put through this, that that kind of in, innocent bystanders were being put through it. Uh, you know, my family was attacked, etc. My wife sort of got a kick out of it. She would she would engage the people who would call her at home. Um, uh, seemed like an odd reaction, but she would uh, decide that that um, uh, as they would call her to, usually the most nasty she'd just hang up on, but if people wanted to have a conversation, she seemed to uh, engage them, which I, I suggested to her was probably, perhaps she had better things to do with her time, but she thought maybe she could convert a few of them, I guess. Pretty strong woman. <laughs> um, so the, the, the reaction of, the, so the CIA makes it clear that the Russians are responsible, um, but it's, it's a year before the White House sort of confirms this, announces it, there's no counteraction, counteroffensive in some ways that goes on. There's a report that's being done, but it takes a very long time to happen. The FBI, you have some problems with the way they, they treated it. Talk a little bit about, you guys are trying to win an election. You cannot become involved, of course, with people in the White House because, of course, then, then, then the, the press is going to come down on you right. uh, for connecting politics uh, uh, with uh, national security <laughs> issues. Um, what's the rock and hard place that you guys are behind and sort of how you viewed what the White House was doing, what they possibly could do, and the what, way the FBI was dealing with it? Well, I, th I think from the White House perspective, um, there was no way for our campaign uh, to engage on the substance of this. I think they, the White House would have been criticized for that and we would have been criticized for it. Um, we expected and knew that this was in fact a national security threat and uh, were uh, hopeful that there'd be a strong reaction uh, to that. Uh, I know the president talked to Putin about it uh, on one of his foreign trips. Uh, but I think the entire government uh, was overly cautious about the uh, what they knew and putting information out in the public and uh, describing the nature of the threat. When the Russians are actively trying to interfere in the democratic process, that's a national security issue. That's not a political issue. And I think they were perhaps overly cautious, not wanting to appear uh, to be uh, interfering uh, in the election. 
Uh, and I think, again, uh, in, in, in retrospect, late in the process, uh, the Director of Homeland Security uh, and the Director of National Intelligence issued a statement saying that the Russians were directly involved in these, uh, in these incidences. Post-election, we now know, uh, it's a little unclear because we don't have access to the, uh, active access to the information. They've drawn additional judgments about Putin's direct involvement, about the fact that uh, this was done by the Russians directly to help Trump, not just to uh, undermine uh, what people's perceptions were about the fairness of the, of the democratic process. Um, when they came to those conclusions, what they knew, you know, I think history will ultimately find out, but it's going to take a while. And uh, I, as we were actively engaged in it, we obviously um, uh, would have preferred uh, that more information came out in a timely manner. Uh, I've been highly critical of the FBI because of the hypocrisy that, that, that uh, I think they showed, both in their uh, engagement and involvement in the direct uh, application of uh, investigations of, of what the Russians were up to in comparison to the massive uh, reaction they had in investigating uh, uh, Secretary Clinton's use of a private email server, which she said was a mistake. Uh, and uh, But at the end of the day, uh, as Director Comey himself said, uh, there was no case, it wasn't even a close call, and yet they put massive resources against that problem. Uh, and it appeared to us on the outside that they were, they were sort of lackadaisical about investigating uh, what the Russians were up to. The incident uh, exposed by the New York Times coverage uh, was the fact that they couldn't bother to even uh, uh, you know, take a Uber over to the DNC uh, 10 minutes away from FBI headquarters uh, to go see someone senior and say, you know, your, your computers are under attack uh, by, the, uh, by uh, uh, the Russian government. Instead, they, you know, left a voicemail on the IT helpline at the, at the DNC, which was, you know, seems uh, uh, in stark contrast to, to what was going on on, on our side. And perhaps more, uh, 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 more completely unexplainable uh, was uh, Director Comey's judgment that he couldn't sign on to the letter that the Director of National Intelligence, 17 other intelligence agencies, uh, the Director of Homeland Security signed on to in October because he thought it might look like he was politically interfering in the campaign uh, and yet uh, released uh, over the advice of senior members of the Justice Department over a long uh, practice of both Democratic and, uh, and Republican administrations going back decades, uh, released the letter to Capitol Hill uh, that, that he was going to take a look at uh, the, uh, the laptop server of, uh, uh, of the spouse of, of, of one of our staffers. Uh, 11 days before the election, uh, really incendiary uh, uh, move by the by the director, uh, only to have a week later say, okay, we looked at it and there's nothing there. Now, I haven't changed my judgment, nothing to it. But the last week of the campaign was consumed uh, by that matter. So uh, it's just inexplicable, I think, to all of us who worked on the campaign that we, he would render one judgment when it came to Mr. Trump and such a fundamentally different judgment when it came to Secretary Clinton. Right. Um, let's go back. After the, those last 11 days, 10 days of, of the campaign, we'll talk about that. Um, you saw Trump people going to the Rust Belt at the very end. <clears throat> um, their people, their pollsters were telling them that there were, there were people they could convince, even in this blue wall, which you know was famously going to prevent uh, uh, and, and win the election eventually, um, what was going on when you guys saw them going to Wisconsin and to Michigan and Pennsylvania, focusing on Pennsylvania? What were you thinking? 
Um, look, I get paid to worry. So I was, <laughs> we were always worried. Those states are a little bit different. They were all battleground states. We had staffed them uh, all uh, to, uh, to the extent that we had uh, higher numbers of staff by maybe uh, a factor of two than, than uh, President Obama had in his reelection campaign. Pennsylvania was an all-in operation for us. We, uh, uh, you know, whether it was her time, uh, uh, our vice presidential candidates under Tim Kaine's time, President Clinton, uh, President Obama, Michelle Obama, uh, uh, Senator Biden, uh, we uh, were always, that was a highly competitive state. We, you know, uh, did whatever we could uh, to win it. Uh, in Michigan, we felt, and Wisconsin, we felt like we had uh, a bit more breathing room, uh, uh, but we resourced those states uh, accordingly. Those were uh, decisions that were being made on a daily basis by our campaign manager, Robbie Mook. Um, and we were uh, trying to track and see what was happening. We saw him going in. Uh, we always knew his appeal was, uh, was uh, essentially uh, to uh, uh, a group of voters who uh, felt dispossessed in the economy, particularly non-college educated white voters. Um, and uh, we felt like we had a strategy of assembling uh, a, a coalition that was a little bit different than than President Obama's. It built on on on, on the Obama uh, model, uh, but was but included uh, college educated voters, particularly college educated women, independent leaning, and even some Republican uh, leaning women. Uh, so we were campaigning where we thought we needed uh, to to run and to win. Uh, and uh, in the end of the day, his surge of vote amongst those voters. And come back to the to the Comey letter. I think the Comey letter ended up uh, hurting us in a, in a in a couple of different ways. That process, the you know the the bookends of those letters, uh, ended up uh, firing up support uh, amongst his voters, and to some extent suppressing uh, support, particularly amongst those college educated voters that I mentioned. So it is what it is. We uh, thought that, uh, again, through the three debates, that uh, we had uh, established a lead, uh, that we were uh, tracking in on a lead, and, and uh, in the, uh, that the overall uh, popular vote, as I noted, was you know remained very strongly uh, in her favor. But in those uh, places that uh, had been left behind economically, he was able to squeeze those votes out. And we knew that was his strategy, and we were trying to counter it. There's been some reporting that, that um, President Bill Clinton um, had complained at some points that, that you know, of course, the, the white working class voters were part of, a hugely important part of his base, um, that he was complaining that um, there wasn't enough energy being spent, that the, the, there was too much uh, focus on the Obama coalition, or, uh, and, and not on, on this group of voters. Is, is that is that true? Look, I think it, most of those conversations took place between him and and our campaign manager. But I think that that um, it, it it is. Uh, I think it it belies the fact that, uh, for for example, in a state like Pennsylvania, uh, we were just all over everywhere uh, in the state, and we had strong surrogate voices like Vice President Biden, who's viewed as someone who really, I, I think uh, that's kind of was his bread and butter politics. Bernie Sanders was out campaigning for us. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was campaigning for us across those, across those states. So, um, you know, there's a lot of what it could have should is in politics, but I think that uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, campaigning based on uh, um, uh, a theory of the case that that uh, that we thought we could be victorious with the that the people we were uh, trying to go after. Uh, we had um, we came out of Philadelphia, for example, with a very uh, a substantial margin, but he had a big surge in the in the middle of the state and the you know western part of the state and was able to 
uh, uh, eke out a narrow uh, victory. Same thing was true in uh, in Michigan and and uh, uh, and in Wisconsin. If you knew the outcome before <laughs> the election, you know you you might make some different um, uh, allocation decisions. But look, he was going places that that we won too. He was you know back and forth to Colorado and um, and and to, uh, and to Nevada and and trying to. Uh, compete in places that that we didn't think were really in play, and 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 turned out. And he went to New Mexico. We thought we had a solid lead there, and turned out to be uh, to be true. He had so offended uh, Latino voters that that uh, that those margins in those states, you know, held for us. So Nevada was uh, not only victorious at the at the presidential level, but we we uh, held on to the Senate seat, picked up a couple of House seats there. Um, let's do election night, and then I'll go back to the debates and the, the convention. Okay. Um, election night, um, where were you early on? What was the mood? I, I remember, again, the polls must have made you guys feel very confident. Earlier in the in, at late afternoon, early evening, I was in touch with our analytics people. I think we weren't seeing anything that was uh, uh, too strange. I think there were uh, different reports coming in from different states. Uh, but um, uh, after doing some uh, press at the at the Javits Center, I went back to the peninsula where uh, where Hillary was and where and uh, where President Clinton was. Uh, and as the returns started rolling in, I think the first indications that uh, that we were in for a long night was uh, the Florida results. We thought we were. Uh, that was going to be a tight race, uh, but we felt like we had a lead there and we thought we were going to win it. And as the more and more vote came in in Florida, we felt like uh, we were just tracking below where we thought we would would be. Uh, and uh, so that, I think, was really the first indicator of uh, that we, we were going to have a problem that night. Mood got a little more tense. Uh, we kept looking at the other states. Uh, other things were performing. Um, other states were performing as we had expected. Um, and then, obviously, all attention kind of turned to those uh, three Midwestern states. We were. Uh, it was it was earlier in the evening in East Coast time, so you know we were trying to look f uh, also at what we were expecting out west in in the Nevada the. Colorado, Arizona, uh, and uh, and uh, and obviously New Mexico, uh, but everything uh, at that point, you know, we felt like we were still in a place where we were uh, likely to uh, win. We, no one was ever overconfident. We always knew this was a tough race, and we went into the into those uh, last days uh, not being cocky. <laughs> Knowing we had a lot of uh, work to do, uh, we felt like we finished uh, st uh, strongly. Uh, I was at the event the night before with uh, President Michelle Obama and uh, President uh, Clinton and Chelsea and and the uh, and the Secretary in Philadelphia. It was a massive crowd. It was tremendous energy. Uh, we w went uh, from there to Raleigh and joined. Uh, a rally that was again with Lady Gaga was, <laughs> uh, and John Bon Jovi that was you know enthusiastic. Uh, people I think were just feeling pumped, feeling good. But by then, kind of uh, tension had set in. We were uh, in the hotel looking at returns, trying to find anything that we uh, could about what was what was happening, and then um, uh, looking both at. The reports we were getting from from our team in the field, uh, from the reports that the uh, ele that the uh, elected officials were reporting, and then what AP was counting, we thought we were ahead in Pennsylvania, and we thought we were ahead in Wisconsin and Michigan. And as those states came in, the vote was tight. Uh, you know, everybody was uh, uh, worried. Uh, and then as the night wore on, and those States looked like they were dipping uh, or tipping towards Trump. Uh, you know, kind of a gloomier mood set in. 
uh, both amongst the staff. We're trying to uh, keep uh, uh, Hillary and, and President Clinton up to date on, on what we were seeing. In the wee hours, I guess, it was probably uh, 12 o'clock in the morning that it felt like those states were beginning it, that we needed them all and we weren't going to get them all. Uh, so it wasn't clear. There were still votes to be counted. We weren't sure, you know, what was in and what was out. We were uh, hopeful that uh, that we would make up the difference in those states. And again, as they, as it turned out, they were all less than 1%. They were very narrow um, <clears throat> margins of, of, of victory for Trump. But uh, but we didn't get there. Um, we were uh, digesting that, and at some point it was clear that we were not uh, gonna, we certainly were not seeing a path clearly to victory that night. We weren't certain we had lost it uh, at, at that moment, but uh, I made the decision somebody needed to go say something, so <laughs> I went over there uh, and told people that we we're going to work through the night, continue to count votes, um, and uh, people could w wait a little longer, but they should go home, and uh, we'd regroup in the morning. So I, w I had made the move over to uh, to J Javits, but back at the headquarters, I think our uh, team back there uh, concluded that uh, that you know we it wasn't clear that we were going to lose all three of those states by then, but it was clear that we weren't going to win all three of those states. Uh, she talked to President Obama and, uh, and then called uh, uh, President-elect Trump and conceded to him. Were you there when that happened? No, I was back. I was over at the Who so. told um, uh, Secretary Clinton that, that, it, that, it, it, that it wasn't going to work? Well, I think by the time I had left, it you know, was feeling that way. It was a sort of blown mood over there. Uh, but but, but in, in, the, uh, uh, in between that time and when I had gone to talk to our supporters, and when I got back, um, she had just uh, hearing from uh, our campaign manager uh, and the person who ran our data analytics. Uh, she was, um, you know, was it was clear to her. I think that President Obama was getting a separate stream of information through uh, his. Uh, people who do politics for him and, and the, uh, David Seamus who runs his political office that it looked like we weren't, we weren't going to get there. Your first conversation with her when you got back to, to the hotel was, was, was what, what, what was that like? Yeah, it was, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think it was like? <laughs> it was, my first conversation with her was, you know, I uh, uh, told her how sorry I was that, that we didn't get over the finish line. I believed on the last day more than I believed on the first day that she'd have been a great president of the United States, and it was it was heartbreaking. And uh, uh, you know, she was as, as she's always been. She's got so much grit um, and grace uh, that I think she was digesting what had happened, but was um, trying to um, uh, you know just reassure other people that, you know, we're, we're going to do what we need to do and tomorrow she'll uh, go and, as she did, make a uh, gracious speech and talk about really what that the uh, ideas that we raised in the debate were still there, that what kind of country will be was still up for grabs, that we we're going to uh, need to stay together as a uh, as a family uh, to ensure that the country didn't go off the rails because we thought that <laughs> it very well could have uh, and, and I still believe can um, given the uh, tendency to divide people rather than bring them together that, that uh, the candidate Trump exhibited in the campaign and President-elect Trump is exhibiting <laughs> in this period of time. And, and uh, so I think we're going to have to, uh, you know, accept the result, but not uh, accept the future. In the very beginnings of the campaign, um, when Donald Trump 
um, starts his campaign is in the primaries. Was there ever a belief that, that, that this guy actually might be the one that, that, that uh, Secretary Clinton would, have, would run against? I was an early adopter of the uh, Trump's for real theory. Um, I thought um, perhaps the moment uh, of realization for me was uh, when he made the famous comment about Senator McCain and that you know he liked people who didn't get captured. And anyone else would have just been blown to smithereens in politics for, for that statement. And uh, his people seemed to like it uh, and sort of bowied him. It went up rather than down. Uh, so there was a, a factor there, call it an X factor, of, of people who just, uh, you know, somehow found that, which I found so despicable, they found it appealing. And it seemed to me that it was going to come down by Labor Day of 2015. I thought it was going to come down, uh, and and said so at the time, to a uh, fight uh, most likely between him and and uh, and Ted Cruz. I thought the other person who might be a factor was was uh, Rubio, but I thought it was that he had a base of support that was significant uh, and was going to stick with them in a very crowded field. Uh, and that Cruz had a base of support that was likely to stick with him in a very crowded field. And the other candidates were having a hard time finding the oxygen to find their voice and get their, their strong base of support. Um, and I think uh, it, to some extent, played out on those terms. At that time, I thought, in the end of the day, the establishment of the Republican Party would choose whoever the alternative was over Trump, that he was still less likely uh, than not uh, to be the nominee. But I thought he was a, a serious factor and could be the nominee. The first debate. Take us to the first debate. After the first debate, what was the conversation like with, with Secretary Clinton? How do, you, how do you think you guys did? Uh, as she had done in the primaries, uh, she took these debates very seriously. It may have been the biggest audience for a debate. Maybe, I, I don't, I, I, I've, I've now forgotten, but um, whether uh, whether the first Obama-McCain debate, I don't even think so. I think it was I the largest was, audience. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so it was the largest audience for a debate. She took it very seriously. Uh, she knew this was an opportunity, talked directly to the American people. One of the few opportunities that's kind of unfiltered by the press, uh, where they, where people could really judge uh, them side by side, uh, and without a lot of, if you will, uh, English on the ball from commentators, from the press, etc. And she uh, worked hard, prepared hard, knew what she wanted to say, and uh, I think delivered a terrific performance. I think he was thrown by it. I think he thought he was a better debater than he proved to be over the course of all three debates. Uh, it had been a successful format for him uh, in that big array of Republican candidates, but I think one of the reasons for that was he could pick his moments uh, when there were 17 people on the stage, or 11 or 10 or whatever, uh, whatever the formats were. Uh, and pick his moments, take his shot, which he likes to do, and then kind of recede. In a one-on-one -on -one debate, you can't do that. Uh, what I think surprised us was uh, in the immediate aftermath of the debate uh, was not that she kind of knocked him off his game, uh, but that he couldn't let the Alicia Machado uh, hit go. We could claim to be geniuses and uh, and uh, have forecast that, but we thought it was a legitimate, uh, 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 very legitimate story, very legitimate punch. Uh, he had been uh, disgraceful, I think, in the way both he treated women, uh, the way he treated uh, uh, Latinos and Latinas, and I think that this was an example of who he was like as a person. So it was a very legitimate shot. 
What we didn't ex- anticipate was that he would keep it going for a whole week by uh, uh, going back on Twitter and attacking her again. And that was sort of um, uh, error on his part. But more importantly, I think she just demonstrated a depth of knowledge, uh, command of the issues, uh, a uh, you know a, a breadth and seriousness uh, that he didn't. We came back uh, in St. Louis, uh, and I think they had adjusted their strategy. I think they they probably sensed that it was going to be very hard for him to just go toe-to-toe with her. Uh, and so the antics started, et, et, et cetera. The Access Hollywood tape had broken just before that. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they uh, decided uh, that if you were in a uh, conversation about who had better ideas and who was better to be president, that was probably not his strong suit. <laughs> uh, so they wanted to mix it up, change it change the dynamic. That's the I women. still think... That's I still, the women and everything. What? That's the women and yeah. everything. Uh, so went, you know, went hard at her, attacked her marriage, did this and that. Um, you know, I don't, I still don't think that worked. I think most of the, most of the post-debate polling showed that, that uh, she had won that encounter as well. Um, uh, and then in the third debate, uh, I think that uh, again, I think that he was, you know, he came out on the on, on the losing side. So we felt those debates had really worked for us. And normally debates don't matter that much in presidential politics. You can kind of go in and things move back and forth a little bit and you come out kind of where you went in. We thought we had uh, uh, moved the public a little bit during the course of these debates. With all the rain. The, the, the basket of deplorables, quote, on 9-9, some people look back at that now as sort of saying it was a turning point that 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 hurt her in the in that in that same group of people that we were talking about before. Yeah. Well, look, it was a slip of the tongue. It's funny if you look at the context, which nobody does, of the entire of what she was the entire statement that she was making. Um, what she was saying was, uh, we we have to listen to the people who have been left out. So I think she was trying to isolate. Uh, the uh, people who had gravitated to Trump, the white supremacists, etc., uh, and say, uh, in that sense, that's a group of people you're never going to reach, you can't reach. Uh, but there are a lot of people who Trump has an appeal to, who voted for him in the primaries, and if you look at the the overall her her entire statement, she was saying we need to talk to him, but the uh, of course, people only quote the soundbite. So, uh, and I think uh, what she said uh, at the time, what she regretted saying, was that half of his uh, supporters, which which she had um, uh, obviously regretted saying, was and wasn't true. Uh, but there was an element of the people who supported him, who were just outright bigots. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, she had given the speech earlier in the year on the alt-right, their connection to white supremacy. And, and, we, and uh, I think it was in that context that she was actually trying to isolate that group of people from the mainstream. But, you know, in, the, in, you know, in, in politics, it, it's, it's a soundbite. You, 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 uh, th- those things stick with you. She did... Uh, apologize for it within hours of, of making the statement. But you, knew, you knew that it, it was probably going to be a problem. Uh, yeah, I think it was like, it was a problem. <laughs> and, uh, and I think, again, it was something that uh, was mischaracterized, caricaturized, not in her heart. I think she was running for president because of what's always motivated her uh, her entire life, which is that she has always fought for uh, people who needed someone to champion their cause, for kids, for women, for families, for people uh, who had been left out and left behind in the society. And I think that 
Uh, she's uh, gotten results for people, but from her days leaving law school, her cause has always been uh, to fight for the people who have been forgotten, for been left out. That's what she did on the campaign. That's what she did when she uh, interacted with people on the campaign trail. That's what, you know, why her policy was oriented at trying to help them. Uh, and when you look uh, behind the rhetoric and the facade of Donald Trump, what you see is really the opposite of that. So, uh, but she said it. It was a, it was a mistake. We, it was probably a costly one.